honor to introduce uh, our other two panelists, and I'll begin right here with a warm welcome to Jose Gonzalez Paramo. He is a member of the executive board of Banco Bilbao Vizcaya Argentaria. I hope I'm more or less, uh, no, uh, not quite right. Okay, well, <laughs> he'll correct me later. He serves as the group's chief officer for global economic regulation and public affairs, and also as chairman of its international advisory board. And he was formerly a member of the executive board here at the ECB, and also has served on Banco de España's governing council and its executive committee. So a very warm welcome to you. Thanks for participating in this discussion. And next to him, we're very glad to have with us Dirk Vater. He is partner in the Frankfurt office of Bain, the consulting company Bain and & Company, and he heads its global retail banking practice with a particular focus on major transformational programs and strategic development for financial institutions, including, uh, above all, digitalization. So warm welcome to you as well. And we're going to now try to bring this uh, to the banks and talk about that technology and banking nexus. And Martin Ford, I know you're not an expert on banking, so I'm going to suggest that in the initial part of this discussion, you just jump in as you like. Just give me a sign if you want to add something or, uh, or comment. And I'd like to begin then to talk about how does the relationship between fintech and the banking sector look at the moment. Uh, and we heard uh, Danielle Nui say earlier, she thinks we've come to the point where there's uh, a mixed role for fintechs in relation to banks, namely as both partners and rivals. So um, asking you, Mr. Gonzalez Paramo, you have said in the past that it is certain that banks uh, are going to change. The main question is, are they going to steer that change proactively, or are they going to be changed. And if you look at where banks are heading in their relationship to fintechs, uh, certainly there was initial skepticism even just a couple of years ago. There was perhaps a little bit of indifference mixed with skepticism. But increasingly, we are seeing banks absolutely embracing uh, both uh, startups uh, directly and also creating their own accelerators. Uh, so the question would be, is that the kind of proactive approach that you think is needed? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, your, your question has many sort of questions. So let, let me first say that, uh, of course, banking will change. Uh, not all banks will be able to change because it's not just about putting apps in a, uh, above the glass in, in, in this uh, device, but also changing the processes that are below the glass, which is not trivial. Um, there will be different modes uh, of interaction with fintechs. Of course, some fintechs are real competitors and go straight to uh, the most profitable lines of banking activity. Think of, I should not name names, huh? but there are big payments uh, uh, fintechs that are not anymore startups, are giants in, in, in the field, and these are real competitors. But there are other modes uh, of interaction with uh, the, the fintechs that could be profitable in helping the banks to change uh, within. So you could think of M&A strategies uh, when it is convenient, or to have uh, partnerships with uh, EI and, uh, that could help you, for instance, in the cloud domains or in blockchain, so partnering with Google or with Amazon or with uh, Salesforce uh, would be a, a clever strategy in this domain. You could even buy some in order to fertilize from within do domains that say loans to SMEs, which is, uh, 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 which is an area where there are many fintechs that do a very good work in uh, scoring, for instance. So you, if you team up, as we do, for instance, in the US with OnDeck, in order to identify the, the, the uh, risk profile for SMEs, you, you increase your, your business. You could have also b uh, ventures. Uh, uh, also, so an, as an investor in, in ventures, you are uncertain or, or as to whether they will succeed or not. So cooperation and competition uh, between us. But on the line, this I think is a very important thing. If you don't have the vision on who is going to be your competitor going forward, if you think that your competitors will be all the banks and not the fintechs or the big giants in the net, you are dead. Because you have to provide the same customer experience as they do. And they are the masters of this. And in order to be able to be at the same level, you have to work like them. And this means very deep changes in talent and culture within organization technology. Very, 
Very good. Thank you very much. And I want to come back to the details of how that can and needs to look. But le let me ask Dirk Vater, in your global practice, what are you seeing in the way of investment shifts on the parts part of banks? Are they moving uh, money increasingly into, for example, artificial intelligence, as Martin essentially predicted in his keynote? <clears throat> they don't have another choice. Um, what we see around the world is absolutely the fact that banks are heavily investing in digitalization, but depending on their own strengths, on their financial strengths, and of course on the leadership team, which how convinced they are about the digital strengths of the future. And there we're going to see um, the differentiation very strongly between win winners and losers um, in the industry, because there are banks who are already still suffering uh, in their local, national, regional competition. And there are also banks uh, on which the leadership team is not as much convinced about the technology trends as perhaps, uh, probably Mr. Gonzalez and myself are. But let me put one point on the, because on the question before, because I often hear that, that our banking embrace in the fintechs, and just want to correct this in the name of the bankers, because it's only one direction. What we do see around the globe is fintechs are also embracing the banks. Because um, there are some very few ones who are very successful, yeah? and they are going to survive and succeed without bank collaborations. But I would say 95% of these fintechs, as in all startup industries, uh, they are struggling. And they are struggling with one fact. This is the number of clients. And that's why the fintechs are also embracing the banks. Unfortunately, these weddings, which are happening all around the globe, I think there has been not the silver bullet yet how to run a perfect collaboration between fintechs and banks. Is it, uh, is it only collaboration? Is it investments? Is it full takeover, integration of the team? So this are still, um, the, the whole industry are still sorting that out. Um, last remark, what, I, what we do see is, um, because they are not missing clients, a much bigger threat uh, coming now from the, Mr. Gonzalez said, big giants or the big tech companies, because they are stepping into financial services, especially in my sector, in retail banking, all around the globe. And they are, from the day one they are entering these markets, they are at scale at scale which no local or regional bank could run when they are entering a fintech market. Let me uh, ask uh, Mr. Gonzalez Paramo to perhaps comment on that and whether that uh, he sees that as a threat, but also the question of motivation here. When banks embrace fintechs, uh, What's driving that? Is it, is it simply the desire and need for greater profitability? That was something mentioned earlier by Danielle Louis in her dialogue. Uh, she said, look, uh, mm. you know, they are hoping that this will drive them toward greater profitability. Would you say that's the main motivation? Well, of course it is, because uh, the, this is one of the main drivers, not the only one. So, but, but you have to understand that the economic environment has not made life easy to the banks. So there is still many uh, a lot of damage in the balance sheet of the banks. We spoke about the NPLs. Second, rates are low, connected to the former. And with low rates, the uh, revenue side is, is a bit impaired. Third, reputation. Banks are not cool. So young generations are not vocationally <laughs> getting close to the banks, neither to work nor to do business with. Regulation. And this is putting pressure also on, on returns. So finally, you have digital. And digital, you can see as a threat, and then you resist. It was an opportunity if you understand that your client is changing fast, because internet is redefining the consumer experience that they want. Uh, so you have an opportunity to do, get closer to them and to overcome the reputational issue if you deliver what they want 24-7. And this is the real challenge. But also, the business models that you are facing are different. It's not taking deposits just to make loans. Business models are concentrating in niches, like uh, many fintechs do, or uh, business models associated to data. Data is the essential thing that makes this revolution different, because these technologies were out there a uh, time ago, but they didn't have enough data to produce knowledge in order to deliver 
value added to customers. Now the amount of data is immense. And if you understand this, uh, it is not just about profits, it's about having full conscience that the consumer, customers are entirely different and are changing very fast. It's not just millennials or centennials. This is also ourselves. I'm a digital immigrant, but I see the advantage of this. And these new business models, there, if you don't realize that you have to compete with them uh, using agile technologies and flexibility as they do, uh, you are lagging behind. So um, assuming that those are the goals of the banks, Dirk Fata, will the way they're approaching this deliver that? Will they, in fact, fulfill the goal of increasing profitability with their approach? I have had fintech uh, entrepreneurs tell me, look, if banks really want to disrupt themselves and get more innovative, they're going to have to do more than just buy a startup here and there or uh, create an accelerator. They need truly proprietary R&D <coughs> under their own roof, uh, essentially uh, moving into innovation the way that a startup would do it and not simply uh, outsourcing this? The answer to this, um, to be clarified, because now the tipping point is the data uh, Mr. Gonzalo was talking about. Because f so far, banks digitalized. They digitalized, most of them on the front end, customer experiences, new apps, um, new solutions in interacting on the customer interface. But most of the banks were sitting on old IT legacy systems, which were totally not the same like a new fintech starting their company from the very day on in the cloud, having totally structurally different cost positioning. But here comes the point now why um, artificial intelligence and blockchain probably also is from our perspective now the real disrupting technology because now banks will be able with artificial intelligence to um, substitute uh, processes which are uh, repetitive. Yeah? Really the, the lower end of the scale what, we, what, what uh, Mr. Ford already said and um, but also some business will be easier. Approaching clients will be easier with data not only on the physical, uh, not only on the online channels, but also on the physical channels. We also already see examples in Asia, by, uh, for example, where banks are using artificial intelligence in their wealth management relationship approach, yeah? saving two hours per relationship manager a day. Yeah? And so the first time now we are seeing with artificial intelligence and potentially blockchain to come to really taking cost out of the industry and therefore at least bringing profitability to a reasonable um, stage back. Mr. gonzalez Parama, may I ask how you see the relative merits of those two technologies? And when you speak with other bankers, uh, what is their approach? Because I have certainly heard that whereas banks are putting more focus and emphasis on AI, many startups, many fintechs, think blockchain is, is going to be the big thing. Would you say it breaks down like that, or is that too simplistic? <laughs> Well, I would not put both uh, at the same level. They are not competing technologies, but they would reinforce each other. They do different things. So artificial intelligence uh, helps expand our minds, our brains, and eventually, at some point, replaces us, or, or, or many of us. Blockchain does away with intermediation because it decentralizes confidence. And in a world which is made with many intermediate steps, it will be revolutionary. Second is, I think, the stage at which we are in, in terms of developing the blockchain is not comparable to artificial intelligence. Blockchain, I think we are a few years to, to have a standard. We are involved in all the main initiatives uh, dealing with blockchain, but blockchain has to solve many issues, including legally, uh, because it's associated to the smart contracts and, and computer capacity. There are many things. Artificial intelligence is there. You speak to your phone. You speak to uh, Siri or to Alexa. Uh, in, in, in Echo, and, and this works. You can manage your account just with your voice, because biometrics and voice recognition is there, is, is, is absolutely ready. So uh, I don't think they are competing. Stages of development are different, but they will, of course, be part of the future uh, set of technologies available to, to the banks. So Dirk Fata, what exactly is that going to mean for the user experience, for the bank customer in future? How's my interaction going to look with my bank? Or am I even going to be interacting with my bank at all? Um, of course you do, um, depending on the segment you are. And depending what, at the end of the day, you can afford 
to pay for these services. For a lot of, pro uh, yeah, in the retail space, we think it is all, it will be all um, digital. Yeah? You are interacting with Alexa on Echo. You are interacting with voice, with your face recognition, with your um, every biometric tool in onboarding with the bank, but also in the, in the overall process, um, you don't need um, uh, physical client advisory services. It probably will change as uh, more attractive or more wealthy the segment gets and as more complex the advice gets because there are, will be, um, it's a function of unsecurity and a function of the duration of investment decisions you as a customer are doing. And as longer and as more complex and unsecure, as more pupils, people will be needed to help you to find these decisions. And that's going to be in, um, in affluent and in wealth management banking, but different than before because there will also be supporting, machines will support these kinds of decisions. Martin Ford, can I ask you to just jump in here? And you're welcome, by the way, to also speak to uh, the, the point about blockchain, uh, if, if that's yeah, something you're familiar um, with. But then I'd like to ask you about this as well. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, in terms of what it looks like in the future, actually, one place to look there is, is China, because uh, they are really ahead of the curve. They've, there's an app called WeChat that you may have heard of. It's put out by a company Tencent. And people there do everything with it. I mean, all their banking, paying their bills, everything can, can be done through this app. And I think that uh, the future looks a lot like that. And of course, all of that just generates enormous amounts of data, and that ties into what can be done with machine learning as well. And that's why Tencent is one of the leaders in, in this area. So I think that this integration of, the, of you know, the tech companies and, and banks is something that I kind of expect. Um, one point you can make is that the tech companies have enormous capital that could be used to acquire banks as well. So they may actually at some point in the future become banks and, and compete directly. That's one thing that many people, I think, um, expect. Uh, as to blockchain, I, I do think it has enormous potential. It's also subject right now to enormous amounts of hype. I mean, it's become the latest and greatest thing. And, and so it's very hard to, um, to really sort of weed out exactly what's happening there. But I do think it's, it has great potential to be very disruptive. So, Mr. Gonzalez Paramo, if all of this were indeed to come to pass, that I have less and less contact with my bank directly, why would I then be loyal to a bank? Are banks going to have to get used to the idea that they have essentially customers coming and going and there's a much more fluid relationship than there has been in the past? Well, there are two dimensions to, to your question. First. Uh, there are two strategies as to the uh, incumbents now. Either you try to adapt and resist and become slowly an infrastructure, like the telephone lines uh, and, and P, sorry, PSD2 is the payments directive. Uh, no, number two is requiring the banks to open up their networks for third parties to operate on them. This process will go and go and go. And if you don't have the capacity to see that you need to keep the relation, direct relation with your customer, you're basically dead as a bank. And the uh, second uh, answer or second dimension has to do with the different modes of interaction that young people have between themselves. You have seen youngsters sitting alongside, talking to each other in the social media. And they don't feel far away. It's the way they interact. So to the extent that you deliver what the customers want, uh, you are close to them um, in spite of the fact that they will go less to the branches because this is not the mode of interaction anymore. Young kids don't understand why a, what a branch is for. Uh, so if you are there 24-7, okay, loyalty will be less than in the past, certainly, because now with one click you can compare. Uh, and, and comparison and transparency is one of the new ingredients. But if you uh, start from a situation, and this is the general situation of banks, where you have the trust of your clients, uh, so you have consent to use their... Uh, data. So you can pull this data with the uh, data that is out there in, in the internet. Uh, using big data techniques, you generate knowledge. And with knowledge, you produce value added products that are satisfying to them. You have a virtuous circle that you can reinforce to, uh, to your advantage, regardless of the fact that you are not in touch physically. Of course, this mode of operation will be open. But now we talk about omni-channel experience where you talk to an employee of the, in a branch, or you go through the iPad or through the mobile or your laptop, you get the same kind of experience. 
even the same visual appearance of things, and of course the same message. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's key. Uh, so contact with clients is not lost, and this is the bottom line for the fact that you interact with them through different uh, channels, uh, which is the, the general uh, trend. So that was the user and customer side. Let me ask about the other side, and in view of what we heard from Martin Ford, would you advise your daughter or your granddaughter to become a banker? That, that, that's, uh, that's another question. No? Uh, let, I'll, I'll see what the capacity is when she blossoms. <laughs> the, my my young, youngest daughter is, is a fascinating uh, profession, I have to say, uh, especially at these very will it remain one? momentous times. Uh? But will it remain one if we have artificial no, 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 no. intelligence uh, moving into the highest echelons uh, of decision making? Absolutely, absolutely. Because this is about understanding that banking is not just about deposit taking and giving loans. But it's about making accessible and easy everything that is connected to finance. And this is not replicated, as far as I can imagine, by any robot or inter, uh, artificial intelligence. So anticipating what you want, and this is big data and consumer experience. For instance, you're looking to a building and see mm, flood number two. Uh, how should I start to negotiate? Now you have an application in the mobile. Our bank offers that, that says, OK, this is the assessor's price that you could start with. And of course, associated to that, we are ready to know that this person might likely ask for a loan. Finance is a source of stress, which is ranks number one in many surveys. Even, I mean, people prefer to go to the dentist than going into a branch of a bank, because it's complex, because it's very important. And if you are mistaken, you can be broke at some point in time and not uh, saving sufficiently and so on. So advice, again, is not, uh, deposit taking and lending, but it's also advising people. Uh, this will never uh, be, I think, replicated by a robot or artificial intelligence. Dirk Vader, what do your studies show in terms of the impact on bank headcount and the footprint of the industry as a whole? First of all, um, in terms of what kinds of qualification capabilities is needed in the future, um, and I think you can summarize it that you need people who are very creative, who are critical intelligent and who are emotional intelligent. Because that are, you know, cornerstones which differentiate you for analytical intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, so keep you safe um, in comparison to robots. So in terms of, yeah, these are definitely jobs which will be very important also in the future for, in, in an industry which is transforming in a such huge way as banking is. In terms of numbers, um, we analyze the different processes and divisions um, across um, business lines. And of course, depending on the individual point of departure of a bank, but in summary, we would argue that 30 to 40% of jobs in the overall industries are at risk through artificial intelligence right now. Martin Ford. Do you uh, care to comment, perhaps, also yeah. on whether you'd advise your daughter to go well, into banking? You know, it's not so much banking or another profession. It's really what kind of job are you going to do within that? And I, I would agree that, that right now, as we look at least to the next couple of decades, the qualities that are likely to make a job relatively safe for human beings are, number one, creativity. Are you really generating new ideas, thinking outside of the box? And the number two would be interaction with people on a deep level, having that emotional or um, you know, the, the, the ability to really understand another person and where they're coming from. So those kinds of jobs that really rely on those qualities for the foreseeable future, not forever. I mean, eventually, you know, nothing is off the table as these technologies advance. But I think that they're going to be relatively safe in banking and also in other occupations. But, the main message is that the last thing you want to be doing is something that's routine and repetitive and predictable, right? If you're doing the same kinds of things, again, then it's definitely going to be susceptible to automation. If I, if I may clarify on this one, uh, is, is less accountants, to be very uh, plastic and graphic, uh, and more about STEM abilities, so science, uh, technology, engineering, math, uh, Experience design, and you have designers out there that sell things just because they go into your into your eyes, and uh, of course IT IT expert, IT architects, uh, because now you need the special IT uh, uh, skills in order to design very flexible IT systems. 
And uh, of course, cloud experts, big data experts. This is the profiles that now make it in banking. Thank you very much. Let's talk about another occupation now uh, and uh, creativity, and that would be the occupation of regulators, um, because of course they are also uh, they are facing new uh, entrepreneurs who don't necessarily fit the old paradigms. And uh, my first question to you, Mr. Gonzalez Paramo, would be whether supervisors are equipped to handle the kind of transformation that we're talking about. We've heard all of you saying, we're going to be looking at, P at, at firms coming in from entirely different industries and uh, essentially moving into this space. Would you say that, uh, at the moment at least, that supervisors are enablers for innovation in this area, or are they essentially putting the brake on it? Well, the, there are many different uh, types of situations, but supervisors and regulators like banks are now grappling with this new, brave, brave new world of uh, digital change. So I understand that you may find very conservative regulators and, and very progressive regulators. Uh, and uh, given that we are now sailing without any maps, because this is entirely new, I think the uh, collaboration culture is essential in order to learn from each other and understand the, the, uh, each other. Of course, you, you may have a very safe uh, pair of hands trying to block all initiatives that are not foreseen in the rule book. OK, you may have a very safe system short term, but in the long term, it will be little of little profitability and uh, ends up with uh, the death, uh, probably, of, of many banks, because this gives advantage to the startups and fintechs. A second thing is level playing field. I think th this is a very serious issue because level playing field means the same regulation for same type of activity. And it makes little sense that for the sake that one activity is being performed by, the, by a bank is regulated differently than uh, a startup. There was a recent study done by the European Banking Authority and published in spring where you find out that at least one third of uh, startups and fintechs handle money from clients without being subject to any regulation, not even AML, which is a bit of scary, because this, uh, in, in the case of a big scandal, it could have knock-on effects on confidence uh, across the board. And, and final point, uh, if I may, uh, progressive regulators now are embarking on understanding that they have to allow experimentation in safe environments. And this means having uh, or putting in place innovation hubs or sandboxes, and also investing in the skills that will make them able to understand what's going on, which means hiring engineers, hiring design experts, having, hiring cyber security experts in order to conclude something, for instance, on the relative merits of cloud computing vis-a-vis -vis mainframes uh, when it comes to security and protection of individual data. Because you have many that say, cloud, whoa. That's uh, very complicated. Where is your data? How safe it is? It looks like if it is in the air, and in the cyberspace is more prone to hacking uh, and to uh, alterations uh, in, in, the, in the data of, of consumers. And this is not what the experts tell you. So you have to invest in these qualities in order to understand, really, uh, whether you should allow things and put banks in, in, in the same footing and on a level playing field with the startups. We acknowledge that we start with uh, legacies in the IT domain that we could overcome uh, uh, more quickly if it were not for the conservatism of many uh, supervisors and regulators. Dirk Vater, perhaps you could weigh in uh, on this question of how we get it right with the playing field. Um, one model that's out there is the UK, uh, its financial conduct authority is viewed by some as, as a model. It prides itself on being a forum for exchange uh, in order uh, to try to tease out some of the issues that perhaps, are, and, and the new uh, paradigms. Uh, is that, do you think, a potential model? And when have the kids outgrown the sandbox? Um, first of all, uh, when I'm talking about um, uh, the the impact on regulators, I always make the comparison that digitalization or new technology, if you discuss that, you usually think about new customer experience, digitalization, as I said before, frontline, a little bit IT. Usually in banks or in organizations, the impact on HR, on compliance, on legal, yeah, on finance, all other overhead functions or uh, controlling functions are often forgotten. 
But the whole organization, as we already talked about, has to adapt. Uh, they, there are new ways of working, agile working for methodologies, for example. So, and as these controlling function has to adapt, of course, also regulators have to adapt into this new technology work, uh, um, time. And yes, uh, what what was invented, I think, in the UK, but it's now I don't know, I think in 10, 12 countries. Hong Kong has it, Switzerland has it now, different Australia, different countries in the world using this sandbox um, um, uh, system to allow on a temporary time, new tests, test, test and learn. We always argue that in the digital space, everything is about test and learn. Yes, then of course, regulators and sandbox is a way to find that, to test and learn. And we agree that this is probably the way how it should be derived in, in other countries as well. Can I just ask you, because you are based in Frankfurt, Bafin, Consumer protection, very high uh, in the Bafin mandate. Fostering financial sector innovation is not an explicit part of that mandate. Does that create problems for a regulator? Do we need to think about perhaps defining regulators' mandates in a different way? Oh, that's a complicated question because I think um, in, in the past, um, regulators already have done a lot of um, Innovate, created a lot of innovation opportunities for in in the uh, in the name of the consumer, which are still facing the overall industry, and in which PSD two is, for example, one of them, and which we still don't know what the impact of these regulations at the end of the day will be in the name of the consumer. So before we come up with a new way of how to sort out things, I would love to digest first. Um, everything what we have to put on the table from the regulator to see what the impact at the end of the day will be. Because PSD2, just as a last sentence, is highly underestimated, highly underestimated by a lot of players all around uh, Europe. I'm 100% sure. Just to add a point on, on, on this one, not about Buffin, of course, uh, uh, which is, uh, of course, the objectives of uh, regulators, which are not always the, the same institution. Buffin has to combine or liaise with the Bundesbank and others here, because there is, of course, solvency, financial stability, consumer protection, and the integrity of the financial system. And all those objectives are equally valid today. But the way you secure uh, how you get there mm -hmm has to be different, of course, when the technology differs. So consumer protection today means, uh, in an overriding way, protection of data, uh, avoiding denial of servers, so good systems against cyber attacks, uh, and, and uh, financial stability should be also in the radar screen. What is financial stability in a world made up by a small number of banks and a lot of uh, fintechs and uh, uh, big uh, te techno companies. Does anyone understand this landscape? Uh, uh, so I would like to hear reflections on how you secure financial stability in this world. Uh, what about solvency? And of course, integrity. Integrity is a crucial part. I mean, you should not allow by any means, and the bad guys with digital have uh, more reach, AML uh, should be as stronger as, as before. You have means, but also the bad guys have the means to, to uh, you know, uh, do, do the bad things, know your clients. Again, this is very or equally valid as in the past, but the way you secure that is entirely different. Um, let me bring Martin Ford in on this point because there is, of course, something called RegTech uh, that says there are technical solutions to the problems that we're talking about, that uh, RegTech is in a position to essentially know the client much better and much faster than any conventional means of doing so that we've had in the past. Would you, would you think that going forward we will see regulators as well essentially uh, become learning machines? I, I think to some extent that will definitely happen. It will have to happen um, in part because a lot of these things are going to move so so fast in terms of the threats that that come, especially you know cybersecurity threats and so forth. A lot of that is going to move at a rate that people can reasonably deal with. So I think it will we will have to rely on artificial intelligence to um, to meet a lot of those threats. Um, but more broadly, I mean, 
there is a lot of creativity, as you say, involved in figuring out how to regulate new technologies, and that's not something that machines can do yet. So there is definitely a very important role for people there. And I think you think, you think back to the financial crisis in 2008, there was a lot of discussion then about uh, how regulators weren't equipped to deal with derivatives. And for, you know, that kind of thing can, can definitely happen more in the future. So we need people that are very prepared to, to deal with rapid change. Let me um, come back to the questions that I asked to the audience at the outset and the question of risks and benefits, uh, and then I want to go to audience questions uh, in general. But last uh, question to both of you, uh, Mr. gonzalez Paramo and Mr. Fata, with the res uh, request for short answers, mm -hmm. if you would. The Financial Stability Board definitely sees both benefits and risks, and in a recent report, <coughs> it highlighted two particular risks. Uh, one, third-party dependencies, meaning the rise of systemically relevant actors who are outside the regulatory framework. You both touched on that en passant, but maybe you can say a word about that. And secondly, the lack of interpretability and auditability of AI and machine learning. In other words, models that are opaque uh, and possibility that those could lead to unintended consequences. And this is something you hear in every uh, industry. It's by no means confined to the financial uh, sector. I recently was uh, at an additive manufacturing event where the TÜV, Germany's uh, essentially quality supervisor, said, you know, we actually are looking at entirely new processes that we don't understand, so we don't know how to certify them. So I, I cannot agree more with two, these two conclusions, but those can be addressed uh, in, in, in a very clear way. As regards third-party liaisons, uh, business continuity requirements should be there. Uh, if you treat uh, these third parties, say, like, like externalization, and you are thinking of the cloud, there are ways to ensure that you don't depend only on one uh, provider. Also, you should push as a regulator for uh, interoperability of clouds uh, in order to sh be able to ship your data uh, immediately uh, when, when you wish or you are not locked in. And uh, of course, uh, there, there is this very important issue of uh, kind of auditing, knowing what's, what goes in uh, or within the artificial intelligence world. And it's quite a difficult thing because algorithms could inadvertently discriminate against the people based on ethically or morally irrelevant characteristics, uh, features like uh, the color of your skin or where do you live. And one should be sure that uh, an algorithm is not introducing discrimination through the back door. That's going to be more difficult, but I think these new technologies could help also in the auditing of, uh, of uh, both artificial intelligence and the very specific part, uh, which is the algorithmic, uh, the algorithmic link into decision making. Fully agree, because I don't want to repeat, but perhaps one another thought on the second one. Um, <laughs> What I'm always discussing when I'm faced with fintechs and incumbents in discussions, fintechs always arguing then the incumbents, how many tech competencies do you really have in your boardroom? How many tech competencies do you really have in your leadership team to really at the end of the day understand what the impact of the strategic steps you are doing will be. So, and this is definitely, um, uh, with all honesty, one of the risks that we have to upgrade the game on technology. Fintechs are tech companies, not fins. They are all technologists. They come from the technology side. They learn financial services as an add-on. Banks are coming from the other direction, but I unfortunately see two less steps in the way that we are really embracing technology as a capability. And there's also one big hurdle that our incumbent industry, that's why they, we are not so opened for the war of talent on these tech people. Or let's face a uh, different, um, different uh, message. We are, probably we are opened, but they are not so uh, much attracted by the industries because they, in the, in the incumbent industries, doesn't feel themselves fully understood. And there's a chicken egg problem, which we have really to crack to upgrade the game and to minimize this risk which was laid on the table. 
Thanks very much. Small anecdote related to the fact that these are tech companies and not Finns. Um, in the reading that I was doing uh, before this event, uh, I encountered one regulator saying, you know, it's really funny because we talk to these fintechs and we can't find any lawyers. <laughs> As a lawyer, I found that very interesting. Um, who has a question for our panel? If you have one, raise your hand. Yes, please. Uh, we have a microphone coming to you. I would have one question, um, basically to Dirk Vater. Um, how would you suggest to banks and also then to supervisors to approach artificial intelligence? How should we build up the capabilities and, and how do you suggest to do that then? Um, first of all, um, you should think about the different use cases where you as a bank, as a regulator, use artificial intelligence. What I always, um, or often see that you know everybody's claiming for the big data lake and saying we need hundreds of data scientists and there's no clear use cases which have to be defined uh, for what you need these data scientists and then this is the second step um, you have to hire this talent you need data scientists all over the place there was I was on one conference and uh, the guy um, I don't remind his name but he said one day there will be more data scientists, data scientists in bank than risk managers. And I tend to agree on this quote. If only because risk managers would be experts uh, in big data. Yeah. Eh? Because now, yeah, yeah, now risk yeah. management is being done on the basis of big data. Eh? I know yeah. that well from uh, our bank. Who else has a question? Please. Mr. Tucker. This is all going to change the way that banking is distributed and what the products look like. But is it going to have any material effect on the structure of bank balance sheets? So if you were Danielle, you should be a bit interested in this. But should you be very interested um, in it in terms of ensuring the safety and soundness of banks? I'm obviously not convinced that she should be more than a bit interested in it. As a citizen, very interested, but in her, given her responsibilities. The, the, this is just a guess. Uh, I presume that the deposit taking activity uh, earmarked to granting loans will reduce its weight in the balance sheets, and the profit lines to the banks coming from other sources uh, would, uh, would increase, associated to fees and commissions on advice and all these services connected to finance. Uh, wealth management is going to go up in all balance sheets. Also, regulation is pushing in that direction. Uh, so if I would have a, to, to give a hunch, I would bet that the loan part and the deposit taking part of the balance sheet will, uh, will go down. You know, I, I would agree with this. Uh, um, I mean, there are some substitute models already out there which are replacing parts of the balance sheets. Yeah? need to be proven whether they are successful as alternative models, peer-to-peer -peer lending. I hardly doubt that this will be such, so, such an impact that it will yeah, highly influence um, Danielle's perspective on the balance sheet. Um, but nevertheless, I fully agree. Yeah? These, these um, directions on the balance sheets, what Mr. Gonzalez said. Thank you. So I had a question in the second row, the lady, if you will put your hand up again so he can see you. Ah, yes, over here as well. And then uh, also Ignacio. It's on. It's on. So, <laughs> I was a bit less optimistic about the impact of fintech, and I think we should go back and um, you know go on the call that Martin Fad was giving. That you know this is a threat, and it was it was already proven as a threat to the manufacturing sector. I wonder whether it's a threat also to the banking sector for the very simple reason that banks exist not because they produce goods, but because they have a monopoly rents which comes from the fact that they manage information. The moment that with FinTech, everybody discloses voluntarily his information on the platform, both consumers, depositors, and uh, borrowers, investors, there is absolutely no service that they are providing. So they have to come up with a new service for their own <laughs> existence. And it's not only in that case the fact that 
people are losing jobs. So financial advisors are replaced by a large now by robot advisors. But simply because the mere existence of the service is under threat. No, I, I would just say that you, you are, I think, reflecting on a static way because this is a very dynamic world. What banks do today has little to do with what banks were doing 10 years ago. So it's now understanding new clients and accompanying the client throughout all the financial journey, which is not just a, a given service like making a payment. Of course, payments is a, quite a juicy part, uh, but this is under threat. Uh, if you provide the confidence, you handle the data of the clients with extreme care uh, to, to the extent that they rely entirely on you. You are permanently anticipating needs because you know a lot of data uh, and, and the journey and the family situation and what they need and what their business is because you're a bank, basically. And you can combine this information with the information that is out there. You're changing constantly the way you provide service to your clients. And this cannot be put at risk if you are sufficiently aware by any given fintech. Real competitor could be the big techs because they have a lot of information. And they can combine it in ways that are extremely clever with not with an unlevel playing field, because uh, they don't give you the information they have uh, to us, uh, the banks. Uh, but they don't want, at the moment, to be regulated like banks. Uh, that's, a, that's a great thing. Uh, because they don't want the hands of the supervisors to be put in the core business of these institutions for a good reason. But at some point, they will find a way. And this is why I said at the beginning, identify your competitors. Going forward, it is not all the banks. It is these guys. But of course, it does seem that there are some banks who don't see it quite as optimistically as you do. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there is a legal complaint, actually, from a group of fintechs saying that banks are denying uh, them information and data that they need in order to um, make some of the transfers that they have, in fact, been hired to, to make by clients. Yeah, I think that's a publicity point. Uh, but but it, it, that's not true. On the contrary, uh, I see that and it's a good thing to have competition with fintechs because this makes us better and stronger. But that's not entirely true. We are obliged now by the uh, PSD2, by the Payments uh, Services Directive number two, and also by the GDP, sorry for the acronyms, the Privacy Directive uh, or no, the regulation that enters into place next year, and we are abiding by that. Uh, we could put the question uh, in the other direction. There are techniques in order to access the data of clients which are not foolproof in terms of protecting privacy and data. Uh, think of screen scraping. And we are not yet there uh, as to the choice of the technique uh, that uh, these uh, third parties use in order to access data from clients. I would not like one of these startups to pretend it's me operating on my behalf, but under the instructions of, of a bad guy. Thank you. So I think Ignacio had a question. And also, uh, I'll go ahead, please, Ignacio. Automation in banking has been going on for a while, and yet I don't think we've seen the type of the decoupling between earnings and productivity that, uh, that Martin has showed for the manufacturing sector. Actually, banks are keep being paid pretty well at most levels. Do you have any interpretation for that? I don't know. I, I give you a chance while I think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um. I can take it back if it's too difficult. No, 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 no. no, no. no. Um, I, I think you are addressing one really important part, which is a lot of banks still mix up automization with digitalization. And through the golden angle of we digitalize now everything, they want to fix homeworks which have, should have been done for decades. So what I'm saying is, um, and I made this point already, the old legacy systems had been always a good excuse for not um, optimizing processes very efficiently. And now, a lot of banks think through digitalization, this is all gone. But at the end of the day, I know this quote is also um, very old, you're still digitalizing old bad processes. So what you really have to do is, really rethink your overall business model. And therefore, artificial intelligence can bring us new ways on how to create businesses than it has been before. 
If I can just make a point, I, I am not aware of any study that compares uh, remuneration and says, okay, at this and this and these levels have uh, gone up or stayed or gone down. What I can tell you is that there was a huge overcapacity in the system and remains. Uh, now there are many more and more banks that uh, close uh, branches when the profits that they obtain from the branch are less than the cost, and this is a rational way to go. Uh, but uh, as regards the productivity such, uh, I'm not aware of, of this kind of thing. But what I can tell you is the following. Uh, regulation uh, on occasion is not helping to hire talent that is externally well paid out there because there is a regulation on the uh, limit, ceiling on remunerations, the bonus vis-a-vis -vis the fixed part. And out there, the, the smart uh, tech uh, uh, guys are used to kind of success uh, payment, uh, which uh, surpasses uh, by many times what is fixed in our remuneration. So we are deliberately or unadvantedly, I don't know, uh, putting banks at a disadvantage with other industries that want to innovate uh, themselves. So in that respect, I would like to see more flexibility, especially when they don't create a genuine risk or when you can ring fence the activity of, uh, of those uh, professionals that help the banks to change from within and be more profitable. But whether the, the remunerations have remained very high or, or low, I'm not aware of any, any study. Yes, uh, I have a question about the artificial intelligence, and it goes back to the beginning of the presentation of Mr. Ford. I also was surprised to see uh, AlphaGo, uh, the new uh, player, the new artificial player created, uh, and that bit uh, that, that was so successful beating uh, humans uh, many times. As I understand, it was amazing that the game. Uh, the machine learn, its, learn on its own without being taught. But uh, I've played uh, Go a couple of times, and as I understand it, it is a purely deterministic game. And life, life is stochastic. Not only life is stochastic, we don't, know, uh, we don't know the underlying distributions. The probability distributions are unknown to us, and we humans, more or less successful, react to that. So my question is, uh, will artificial intelligence move to the next step and, co and cope with a stochastic world? I, there's you know, evidence to suggest the answer is yes. I mean, certainly the, the researchers in the field are working on that. In fact, uh, DeepMind, the, you know, the, the company that did AlphaGo, they're very interested in it. <coughs> they're moving on to other kinds of games, video games that require uh, advanced planning, for example, and these kinds of qualities that are more like real life. So, so you're right. Um, right now, it is limited to very deterministic things. And, and artificial intelligence, as it exists today, is very narrow and specialized. And it can do certain specialized things at superhuman levels of, of competence. Um, but it will certainly get broader and more capable. Um, and, and no one really has the, exa the, the answer to exactly how far it can go. But many people expect that Ultimately, it will. And what that means, we will address perhaps uh, at a future <laughs> Congress. But for now, let us please give all of our panelists a very warm round of applause. So thank you. And we go now to a coffee break. And we'll return probably in about 20 minutes, more or less. So um, thank you very much for your attention, ladies and gentlemen, and for your good questions. <laughs>